Have you ever had a vice that you keep going back to? Maybe it's something sort of harmless, salty potato chips or shopping or League of Legends. But sometimes addictions can be so severe that not having the object of your desire can be fatal, like League of Legends. Evolutionarily speaking, it's an interesting problem. There is no increase in my evolutionary fitness in indulging these vices, and yet we are capable of being hardwired to seek these meaningless rewards. While addictions have been known to rewire the minds of higher organisms, a question remains. Can something as simple as a single-celled bacteria experience addiction? If so, what would that look like? The answer is yes. Mobile genetic elements called plasmids have the potential to be devastatingly addictive, taking the lives of those who acquired them hostage. But before we get into examining the existential nightmare these addicted bacteria face, we must first understand what a plasmid is. To start off, a plasmid is a piece of circular DNA that can live inside bacteria. These bits of DNA are separate from the bacteria's chromosome. They replicate independently of their larger cousins and often contain useful bits of code that help the bacterial host with things like antibiotic resistance. When bacteria exchange genetic information, they can often share copies of plasmids with one another, increasing overall antibiotic resistance in the population. Over evolutionary time, a special type of plasmid evolved, the toxin-antitoxin plasmid. Its properties make it so that the bacteria that get this plasmid are instantly and deeply addicted to having it, so much so that if an addicted bacteria were to lose this plasmid, their life would be forfeit. How could something like a piece of DNA be addictive? Let's take a closer look as to what this addictive plasmid actually codes for. A basic toxin-antitoxin plasmid codes for two things a toxin and an antitoxin. We'll use one of the most well-studied addictive plasmids as an example. The R1 plasmid found in E. coli in addition to the normal stuff that plasmids tend to have also codes for two genes, HOC and SOC. The HOC gene codes for a potent host-killing toxin, a short protein under 100 amino acids long that destabilizes the bacterial cell membrane. For reference, the protein ATP synthase, the enzyme that makes the cellular fuel ATP, is a whopping 5,000 amino acids long. The SOC gene encodes for an mRNA that prevents the toxic HOC protein from getting made by binding the HOC mRNA, preventing it from entering the ribosome the protein factory of the cell. This double-stranded RNA is then recognized and destroyed by RNA-degrading enzymes, called RNases, stopping the Hawk mRNA from ever being made into protein. How does the SOC mRNA know to bind the Hawk mRNA? Hawk and SOC are actually very closely related to one another, kind of like evil twins. They lie on opposite strands across each other on the bacterial chromosome, and they have a lot of overlap. Since their DNA is mostly complementary, meaning they fit together already, their mRNAs, which are made from the DNA template, are also going to have large regions of this complementary binding. The reason why this plasmid is addictive is because once a bacteria gets this plasmid, it literally cannot live without it. Having the plasmid means you are making the thing that kills you and the thing that saves you. The Hawk protein and mRNA are both long-lived. The SOC mRNA, however, is very short-lived with a half-life of just 30 seconds. E. coli has to constantly be pumping out a ton of antitoxin just to stay alive. If, for whatever reason, the bacteria were to lose that plasmid, the antitoxin would quickly degrade but the mRNA that makes the Hawk toxin will still be around, able to be made into protein, killing the bacteria. What might cause a bacteria to lose its plasmid? The answer is replication. The R1 plasmid is a low copy plasmid, meaning the plasmid does not get replicated very frequently in bacteria. When bacteria split into daughter cells, there is a chance that one of those daughters does not inherit the addictive plasmid. But what they will inherit is a bunch of free-floating Hawk toxin mRNA. In those daughter cells lacking the addictive plasmid, Hawk mRNA gets turned to Hawk protein which kills the cell. Meaning once a bacteria picks up an R1 plasmid, not only will it be permanently addicted, but all of their descendants will be too. It's pretty messed up. 
Some of you more biologically inclined folks might be wondering to yourself, after millions of years of natural selection, why in the heck would a bacteria evolve this piece of DNA that is not obviously useful, potentially deadly to its hosts, and puts a strain on its mRNA and protein making machinery? The answer isn't obvious, so here are some possible hypotheses from some very smart people. Hypothesis 1. Altruism. A somber take on how this system evolved comes in the form of self-righteous sacrifice. In times of starvation, an addictive plasmid might have evolved to give bacteria a way to free up nutrients for other bacteria to survive. When bacteria are stressed, their overall drive to make mRNA and protein decreases, potentially decreasing antitoxin production just enough to destroy the cell and freeing up its nutrients. This suggests that bacteria have evolved an equivalent to apoptosis, programmed cell death. While programmed cell death in eukaryotes like you or me involves a ton of complicated genetic circuits, this hypothesis suggests that bacteria may have primitive versions of this pathway, involving just a handful of genes. Hypothesis 2. Stress Tolerance Some plasmid addiction systems, like RHEL-BE, produce a toxin that stops bacterial protein production. RHEL-E destroys messenger RNA, preventing mRNA from being made into protein. This toxic effect might come with the side benefit of forcing bacteria into a low production, sort of hibernation mode. Similar toxin-antitoxin systems might be used to develop bacterial persistence, which is a bacteria's stress response to antibiotics. Bacterial persistence is different from resistance. When bacteria are resistant to an antibiotic, it's because they've got genes that make the stuff that directly counter the antibiotic. Bacterial persistence is a general stress response that shuts the cell down in response to any sufficiently stressful antibiotic treatment, and is not dependent on the presence of specific resistance genes. Maybe systems like RHEL-BE evolved to quickly boot into safe mode to prevent being wiped out by stressors like starvation or antibiotics. Hypothesis 3. Antiphage Resistance Some plasmid addiction systems have been shown to act like a bacterial immune system. I already did a video on the war between bacteria and viruses, but as I teased there, there's so much going on between those two little guys that just one video would not have been enough. When viruses infect bacteria, they take over a lot of their mRNA and protein making machinery to pump out copies of themselves. Well, if phage hijack making mRNA, then the antitoxin mRNA might not get made, allowing existing toxic mRNA to be made into protein and, well, you know the rest. This means that phage that happened to be too good at hijacking a bacteria's mRNA making machinery might instead find themselves denied a host to replicate in. Hypothesis 4. Genome Stabilization some addictive genes are integrons, mobile DNA fragments that have the ability to insert itself into bacterial genomes, or the chromosomes. Addictive integrons may have evolved as a way to protect bacteria from large-scale gene deletion. Replication of DNA isn't always perfect, so if something happens in the replication cycle to mess up DNA, if the addictive module is deleted, then that prevents inheriting that deletion because the daughter cells would die without the antitoxin. You could argue that large-scale genome deletions are probably deadly to cells anyway without this addictive module, but it has been experimentally demonstrated to force bacteria to keep certain genetic elements, potentially raising overall fitness of a bacterial population. You can think of this like the addictive part of DNA threatening mutual mass destruction if the genes nearby are deleted. Hypothesis 5. Selfish Genes this hypothesis is both my favorite and my most feared. When Charles Darwin came up with the origin of species, he had outlined natural selection to act on the level of organisms. Traits that were good for the organism would persist, while traits that were not good for the organism would disappear, leading to gradual changes in species. He came up with that hypothesis without even knowing about genetics, because Mendel's work in pea plants would not be acknowledged for many years later. A more recent cohort of biologists have purported that natural selection does not have to work on the level of species, but could work on the level of genes themselves. That means genes do not have to benefit an organism to be inherited, as long as that gene somehow makes it more likely for itself to be transmitted. 
It just so happens that most of the time, genes that are good for the survival of the species also happens to be good for the gene. But a truly selfish gene is kind of a scary thought, little bits of parasitic code that do not benefit the organism at all and just exist to propagate themselves, slowly but surely reducing the efficiency of its host. Kind of like a virus. Is there any evidence that these addictive systems are purely selfish? At least one of them, the CCDBAB system appears to be. CCDB is a gene that makes a protein that interferes with DNA gyrase, an enzyme required for correctly unwinding DNA during replication. This poisons the cells by interfering with bacterial reproduction. The antitoxin CCDA codes for a protein that stops the toxin from binding DNA gyrase. So the question remains, is this system purely selfish? A significant proportion of naturally isolated bacterial samples had broken CCDAB toxin-antitoxin systems. Having a non-functional toxin in the toxin-antitoxin system did not appear to be harmful for these E. coli, supporting the idea that the toxin-antitoxin genes were truly selfish, serving no beneficial purpose for its host. Kind of like a tool you broke. If you haven't replaced it yet, you probably didn't really need it. For many scientists and engineers, this little bit of bacteria trivia is more than just an interesting story, it's potential inspiration to develop technologies. One potential application is to improve biological engineering. We use genetically modified bacteria all the time, but the issue with modifying bacteria is it can be kind of tricky to get your DNA to remain in bacteria. Addictive plasmids may allow us to more efficiently produce genetically modified bacteria by forcing them to keep their modifications by gunpoint. You can also imagine the utility of studying the toxins that these bacteria evolved to produce as potential inspirations for future drug discovery. These things are pretty sick. So, do bacteria experience addiction? It kind of depends on how you define addiction. There's not an emotional or a cognitive attachment to addictive genes, but they're not obviously beneficial to the host. Once you get hooked on them, you're pretty much hooked for life. It does capture a lot of elements of addiction as we eukaryotes see it. Kind of makes you feel bad for these little guys. That's kind of all I have to say about bacterial gene addiction. I hope you found the plight of these little guys to be of interest, and if you did, please remember to subscribe for more biology content. If you have a biological phenomenon you'd like for me to look at, let me know in the comments. I'll add it to the rapidly growing Google Doc. And that's it. Thanks for watching.